life of faith is all about. That's what the Lord tells us to expect from Him. You know, there's a passage in the Word of God that encourages us to call those things that are not as though they were. And I know there are lots of uh, interpretations of that and all kind of wild uh, descriptions of what that means. But it really means basically that whatever life looks like, whatever, whatever the opposition, whatever the struggle, whatever the, the obstacle that's in your path, that you must know that the Lord is working in your life and that He's going to push you past that obstacle. That He's either going to move it or He's going to give you the grace and the, and the mercy and the power to live through it in life. You know, a lot of times the, we, we want the Lord to remove something and we want Him to take it completely out of the way so we don't have to deal with it anymore. But the promise of God is that not that He would remove it, but that he would lead us through it. You know, the 23rd Psalm that we all love so much and everybody in the world, whether you're a Christian or not, almost knows the 23rd Psalm by, by heart. It says, and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. And he would lead us through these things to victory. So I shout my way out of the valleys. You know, I sing my way over the mountain because that's what God expects from me. And I look at those things that appear to be something and call them what I believe God has something to do with. So we're speaking by faith and knowing that God is, is going to take care of things. I know a lot of times I can get stuck on something in my own life, whether it's something physical or something emotional or something spiritual or mental, you know, and you just kind of obsess on that thing. And it just really... Uh, uh, it really brings agony into your life because you're obsessed on this and, and, and you torture yourself by saying, why can't this go away? Why can't life be the way it used to be? I, why do I have to deal with this? And, I, and you just torture yourself by, 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 by throwing yourself back and say, I want it to be like it used to be and why can't it be like it used to be and how could God let this happen to me? But what comforts me, I've learned in all of my years is uh, to just basically look at it and say, okay, one of two things are going to happen with this thing in my life. One is God's going to remove it. God's going to take it away. I'm going to be well again, whole again. I'm, I'm going to be healed, cleansed, whatever it might be. Or if that doesn't happen, God's going to give me the ability to go through this thing. God's going to strengthen me. God's going God's to comfort me. God's going to move in my life, and I'm going to be able to handle this thing no matter what it is. So either way it happens, it's a victory for us in our life. And just remember, it won't always be like this. <laughs> yeah, you won't always feel that way. There's hope in the, every situation because God is working in our behalf. So anyway, that really doesn't have anything to do with the fruit of the Spirit, at, uh, you know, really <laughs> internally, but, but maybe that'll help somebody's life today. I don't know. God brings us all together, and he has words for all of us. And, you know, there's sometimes it's part of the message, and sometimes it's, it's part of what God says to us in our praise time and in our worship time that God would, would open the door to speak to all of our hearts. And after all, that's what we really want. That's why you're here. You're here because you want to hear from the Lord, right? right. I mean, you want God to say something to you. You, you want something to matter today, right? Something you hear to have some impact in your heart. You're not just here to hear history lessons or biblical theology lessons or, or hear stories about Jesus or whatever it might be. You're here because you want God to say something to you that will matter in your life. And we're all seeking that. So uh, I pray that the Lord had, had that in the heart for somebody in this place today. Maybe a lot of us, somebody's in our place. So we now are in our eighth message on the fruit of the Spirit, and we've come to the eighth one. Of course, you recognize and realize that the fruit of the Spirit is really the, the personality of Jesus uh, that indwells our life, the nature of Jesus, the, the, the Spirit of Jesus that lives inside of us it is called the fruit of the Spirit. You know, in, in, in nature itself, uh, if, if, the, if the sap of an apple lives inside the, the tree, uh, the tree produces apples, right? If, if it has the sap of a cherry inside 
itself, it produces cherries. If it has the sap of a pear inside it, it produces pears. And of course, the, uh, the observation is, is just quite natural, and that is uh, it, whatever's on the inside uh, eventually shows up on the outside. And if we have the sap of the Spirit of God and the personality of Jesus and the nature of Jesus inside of us, then what's going to be birthed out of us uh, is the fruit of Jesus that's living on the inside of us. If I took a bottle of something, you know, like this, I took a bottle and I just began to shake it up and I, and I all of a sudden pop that cap off and let it spew out, what, what would spew out of this bottle? Yeah, whatever's in it, right? <laughs> if it's full of vinegar, vinegar's coming out. If it's full of uh, honey, honey's coming out. So what our life really is, in that analogy is, uh, what, ha what, do you sp what spills out of you when you get shook up? Because when you get shook up, that's what you're full of. And, and the fruit of the Spirit says what Jesus wants to spill out of our life are, is, is the fruit that reflects Jesus, his nature and his personality. So what was Jesus like? Let's suppose somebody asked you, all right, in nine words or less, I want you to tell me what Jesus was like. Well, you'd probably start off by saying, well, Jesus was, uh, was loving. Uh, he, was, he was full of love. He was, he was full of joy, you, you, you might say. And then, and then, well, he was always at peace, so, so that would be Jesus. And he suffered a long time, especially with people that did all kind of evil things against him. He was a very good man. He was filled with gentleness. He, was, he had unbelievable faith in his life, and he was very strong. He had the power of God and he could do anything, but he somehow managed to keep that power under control. You know, he could have destroyed the world. He could have set himself free. He could do anything he's got, but he kept that power under control and, and didn't annihilate people when he had the perfect reason to. And as a matter of fact, he always seemed to be under control. He had control of his spirit and life, and he he just did what he saw his father do. He wasn't even a freelancer. That's what Jesus was like. That's what Jesus, uh, that's the, the spirit of Jesus in this world. And so what this passage is telling us is that that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. The Holy Spirit wants to recreate the personality, the nature, the spirit of Jesus in our life. And what is the Spirit of Jesus like? Well, it's, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. The fruit of the Spirit is singular, as in contrast to about, about what, six verses earlier in verse 19, where he contrasts the fruit of the Spirit by saying, the works of the flesh are these. And then he begins to say envyings, drunkenness, murder, fornication, adultery, lasciviousness, you know, uh, envy, greed. And he lists about 17 things. And then he ends with saying, and so on, you know, just multiple things that are the work of the flesh. The works of the flesh are, and then he names all of these things. As if, well, you know, you may not have all of these things, but you can have some of these things. You may not be a murderer, but you like to lie. You may not be a fornicator, but you will, uh, you know, you will take advantage of somebody. And, and you, may not be a, you may not be an adulterer, but you really do like to gossip about people and envy and strife and discord and sow that among the brethren. So there can be all kinds of works of the flesh and you can have some of them and not have some of them. But when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, by contrast, it's the fruit of the Spirit is, not are. So is is singular. It means there's one tree of fruit of the Spirit, and it has all nine flavors of the fruit on one tree. So you can't just have love and not joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness. You just can't be gentle and not have love and joy and I mean, you can't have these things individually. You can have them only as the fruit of the Spirit brings all nine fruit out of your life to manifest the personality of Jesus in this old dark world that we live in. 
So in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, I know many of you that are Bible students understand, and you've heard it before, that Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is, uh, is, called, is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is called by many the constitution of the kingdom of God. If you want to know what the kingdom of God is, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Because Jesus is speaking on the mount in this incredible sermon, and he's, and he's speaking in all three chapters saying, the kingdom of heaven is like this, the kingdom of God. And he, and he interchangeably talks about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, which are the same exact thing. It's the kingdom where Christ is in control, where God rules, and, and it's that future perfect kingdom that's going to be, and it's, part, and it's what we're part of in our spirit right now. If you know Christ and you've come to Christ, you right now are part of the kingdom of heaven. Your spirit is dwelling in the kingdom of God, and it's not fully come to fruition yet, but one of these days, it's going to come to fruition, and it's going to complete itself. But right now, we're living in the old nasty now and now, and one day in the sweet by and by, and the sweet by and by is going to be the kingdom of God. Well, what is the kingdom of God like? Well, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 said, here's what the kingdom of God is like. And so if, if Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the constitution of the kingdom of God, then the first few verses of Matthew 5 would be the preamble to the constitution of the kingdom of God. And what does a preamble do? Well, a preamble says, here is what the Constitution is about. You know, as a, as a country, the United States of America, we have a Constitution, right? And, you know, we have a Bill of Rights, one, two, three, all the way down, and it, and, and it enumerates in our Constitution everything that the government does not have authority to do in our lives, which is a wonderful document. And bless God, if it wasn't for that, we'd be in big trouble. I'm telling you the truth. This Constitution says the government can't do this, and the government can't do that, and the government can't do that, and it limits the power of the government. Well, in our U.S. Constitution, we also have a preamble to the Constitution that tells you this is what this Constitution is about. And it says stuff like, now, did any of you have to memorize the preamble to the Constitution when you were in like the fifth grade or something? It seemed like about the fifth grade, we had to memorize the Gettysburg Address. You remember that? We had to memorize certain documents and so forth. I don't know if they even do that in school anymore. But one of them was the preamble of the Constitution. And the preamble of the U.S. Constitution says, in order to form a more perfect union, what is the Constitution for? Number one, in order to form a more perfect union. Number two, to establish justice. Number three, to ensure domestic tranquility. Number four, to provide for a common defense. Number five, to promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. That's what the preamble says that our Constitution is all about. Well, if Matthew 5, the first few verses, is the preamble to the constitution of the kingdom of heaven, what is the kingdom of heaven supposed to be about? Well, if you look at what these verses say, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those that mourn, blessed are the meek, and it just carries on so forth, so forth, and so forth. Those of you that have been with us for many years now, uh, remember that I preached on the on the Beatitudes, might do it again, but I think it's been about five years or more since we've done it. But the word blessed comes from the Greek word markyrios. You remember this? And the Greek word markyrios can just as easily be translated happy. Happy are those. So what does that mean? What is it saying? Well, it's saying that the kingdom of God is intended to do what? To make you happy. That, that, that the, everything that follows is intended to show you how to be happy and to make you happy in life. You are blessed and you are happy, you know. You're happy if you're poor in spirit because the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. You're happy when you mourn because God's going to comfort you. You're happy when you're meek because that's going to allow you to inherit the earth. You're happy when you hunger and thirst after something real, righteousness, because God's going to fill you up with righteousness. And you're happy when you're merciful because what you give, God's going to give, give out. God's going to give you and you're going to obtain mercy. And you're happy when you're poor in heart 
for you're going to be able to see God and you're happy if you're a peacemaker. doesn't say you're happy if you're a peace lover. Everybody loves peace and wants peace, but it says if you actively make peace, it said blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace lovers. And if you are trying to be a peacemaker, you know that you can get your eyes jowled out. You know, and you can, you boy, a peacemaker is a big deal. But if you do that, he says, because you're going to be called the sons of God and blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all evil against you falsely in my sake. You can rejoice and be exceedingly glad because God's got a reward for you in heaven. That is the preamble to the constitution of the kingdom of God. And what is it saying? It's saying whether you are happy or whether you are not happy, it is based on your attitude in life. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, I hope you have a good attitude. Well, that determines whether you're happy or not in life. If we can have, look, if we can, all right, we call, those, we call all of those, those that I just read, we call them the Beatitudes. That means they are attitudes that we are supposed to be, right? They are happy attitudes. They are blessed attitudes. And so what is the word telling us? The word is telling us that if, 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 this, if these are our attitudes, then the same joy and happiness that Jesus had, we can have because we will have the same attitudes as Jesus had in his life. So I know that you notice this, the, the third attitude, the third B attitude is the same, a, same as the eighth fruit of the spirit and that is blessed are the meek because we're gonna inherit the earth. So what is, what is, I know in this can all you get, get all you can, sit on the lid and poison the rest, the kind of world we live in today, that it seems really ridiculous to, to equate meekness with inheriting the earth. If we really be honest about it, if we hear the word meekness, we tend to think, well, if the, if the meek really did inherit the earth, some bully would come along and take it away from them. <laughs> uh, like, uh, who owns this place? We do. Well, give it back. Okay. You know, uh, we think that somehow uh, meekness is not something that would be very powerful and very strong. As a matter of fact, the, wor the word meekness has gone out of style, really. Uh, no, we don't really hear people talk about being meek anymore. It used to be a good word. But if somebody describes you as meek, but now if somebody describes you as meek, you might think it was an insult or a slur. If I said Mitch, Mitch is one of the meekest men I know, he might, he might get offended by that because it means he's weak or he's you know a sissy or a wimp or something like that. I, I, I doubt whether, I mean, most of you that are still working in life, you have a resume, right? Well, how many times does the word meek appear in your resume? Yeah, it probably doesn't appear in your resume because you don't think of that as being a good thing. You know, as a matter of fact, it's really a buzzword. You know what a buzzword is? A buzzword is a word that you can hear, and when you hear it, it, it produces an image in your head. Like the word charismatic is a buzzword. When you hear the word charismatic, which simply means gifted by God, which is what all of us are if we're born again, but when you hear the word, many of you think uh, swinging on the chandeliers, jumping the you know the pews in front of you, and and running up and down in the altar, speaking in some language that nobody ever understood. You know, it's a buzzword. It's become a buzzword. So when you hear the word meekness, what do you think of? Well, you might think of Popeye with no spinach. You know, for us older ones, or some kind of wimp, or some kind of sissy. When I say the phrase meek as a, what do you think? Meek as a mouse or meek as a, a, a lamb? Well, do you notice the relationship? And all of them have it, but let me just move on and put one verse up there for you. They're all like this. Do you notice the relationship between the pronouncement, which is that first line, and the blessing, which is the second line? Do you, did you notice that all of them have pronouncements, and then they have a blessing that is attached to that pronouncement? Blessed are the meek, well, why are they blessed? Because they're going to inherit the earth. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's the pronouncement. Well, why, why are the poor in spirit blessed? Well, the blessing is for, for, uh, for they shall be called the sons of God. I mean, you know, in other words, every one of these blessings have a pronouncement associated with it. Jesus didn't just say, happy are you when you're meek, happy are you when you're persecuted, happy. I mean, he, he associates it with a reason why you can be happy. And so what is this talking about? Well, obviously he's talking about uh, a time when he's going to rule and reign this earth. So blessed are the meek. If you've come to Christ, you can be genuinely meek. Well, that means that right now you have a level of meekness because you belong to Jesus and the Holy Spirit lives in your heart and Jesus lives inside you and you are, you are a meek person. So you are living in a certain level of meekness right now. But what this verse says is that there are more levels of meekness that you're going to be able to enjoy in life and that one of these days you're going to come to the fruition or the completion of what it means to have real meekness in your life. What in the world could that mean? Well, I know many of you have read the Gospel of Matthew, right? You come along to chapter 20 in the Gospel of Matthew, and you come to these to some parables that Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like this, and the kingdom of heaven is like that. And one of those parables is the parables of the talents. You remember this? So a, 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 a rich person left his left one day and left uh, some money with his servants, some five talents, some three talents, some you know one talent. And when he comes back, the five had earned five more, and the the, the two had earned two more, and one had buried it and all of that. And and the landowner just rebukes the one that just buried it and hid it, but he 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 praises the ones who invested it and it's gone forward. And then he says a strange kind of little saying that it's like, what? when would that make sense? Where he says, I tell you that one of these days is coming the time when the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And we go, what in the world would that be talking about? And then you go on to like Matthew 25. And when you get to Matthew 25, you get to the parable of the, uh, 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 of the laborers. And in the parable of laborers, you know, he hires all these laborers and he pays them all the same thing, although they're hired at, at different times. And, 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 the, and as you read it, you go, well, that's not fair. Well, that's not fair. These guys came in right at the end and these guys, you know, came in right here. They've been serving a long time and they're getting, going to get paid the same thing that these that came in at the last minute. And then Jesus says another strange thing. He says, well, remember this. He who has been faithful over a few things, I'm going to make him ruler over many things. You go, when would that ever happen? Well, what he's talking about is the fact that right now we live in a limited kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is limited on this earth, but that one day the kingdom of God is going to be loosed over this, all, this whole world and Jesus Christ is going to sit on the throne and rule and reign and bring judgment against this world. The book of Revelation says that's going to happen at the, at, at, at the kind of semi-end of time. There are a few things after this. But what it says basically is one of these days, the Lord's going to take us off this earth. We're going to go to heaven to be with him. And then tribulation is going to happen for seven years. And then after those seven years, Jesus is going to come back and set up an earthly kingdom that's going to last for a thousand years. It's called the millennial kingdom. And we are going to come back with him. And what are we going to do when we come back with him? Well, he's going to sit on a throne on this earth, and he says, you're going to sit on a throne on this earth, and he's going to rule over this earth, and he's going to let you rule over this earth, and he's going to speak over this earth, and he's going to bring judgment over this earth, and those that sit on the throne with him are going to speak and bring and rejoice and have the same glory that he has as he sits on the throne. And those of you that seemingly were the last in life are going to be the first in the kingdom of God. And though you might be overlooked and overwhelmed right now, it's not going to be that way forever. And God's going to reward you and put you on top rather than on bottom. You'll be the head and not the tail. And God will, God will place you on top. And if you've been faithful over a few things, he's going to make you ruler over many things. Because if you have your spirit under control, if you have the wild horses of your life 
uh, bridled up so that they can be controlled in an area. If, you, if you're hooked up to the kingdom of God, which is true meekness, then only you have the authority and the right to bring judgment or, or justice to anyone else because you have first brought judgment and justice against yourself. And you have your life under control, therefore you now have the right to have others and to, and to have others in life to make judgments against them. That's what it means. Happy are you if you're meek because you're gonna have the right to rule and reign with Christ in the kingdom of kingdom to come, so you will inherit the earth. That's what that's talking about. Well, how would we understand meekness? Well, I can say to you, and I know I, I wrote it in your outline, for those of you that have that very limited outline that I gave out, um, what is meekness? Well, one thing I can tell you is it's not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. Everybody say that out loud. Meekness, meekness is not weakness. There are only two people in the Bible that are described as meek. One of them is Jesus, and I don't think Jesus was weak, do you? And the other is Moses. In the book of Numbers, chapter 12, the Bible says that Moses was a meek man. The meekest man of all the earth is what it says. So two people were described as meek, and that's Jesus and Moses. So we know that meekness is certainly not weakness. Let me, let me mention that in the Greek language, that many of the words in the Greek language, most of the words actually have word pictures that are associated with the word so that when the Greeks speak the word, certain pictures pop into their mind. And the word, and, and, and as an example, a word we're probably very familiar with is the word Baptist or baptize. What does the word baptize mean? Well, in the Greek, it's, not, it's almost a transliteration, is the word baptizo. Baptizo is translated Baptist. Well, if you went to a Greek restaurant and you said, would you show me what the word baptizo means? The waiter would most likely take a glass, take a spoon, and just plunge that spoon into the glass. It, the word literally means to plunge, to immerse. So all of our Baptist friends are actually plungers. That's what the first plunge church, you know, first church of plunge. <laughs> so that's what the word means. It means, to, it means to plunge or to immerse. Well, the word meekness is the word praetes. And praetes means a, a couple of word pictures. Number one, it means a strong medicine that is used to uh, control a raging fever. In other words, a medicine that's powerful enough to bring a raging fever or a raging infection under control. That's what, that's what pre preates means. Or the second picture is, I think, a little more beautiful picture, and it's the picture of a, of a beautiful wild stallion. I mean, I picture some on some of these commercials where you see that giant muscular stallion and he's reared and his mane is flowing and his tail is flowing and he's pawing the air and he's powerful and he's muscled up and he's rippled. And then as he runs, he's fast and he's, and he's powerful in his running. But, but of course, he has no control over anything. Nobody's ever caught him. Nobody's ever bridled him. Nobody's ever put him in a pen. He's just wild and he just runs in every direction. Well, 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 praetes means that you capture this stallion and you don't break the stallion as if to break his spirit so that he just becomes a worthless nag to pull a milk wagon. It means that when you capture him, uh, you don't break him. You just basically try to come to an agreement with him, you know, and, and, and you put a bridle on him and now he's just as fast. He's just as strong. He's just as powerful. He's just as spirited. And he's just as, as good as he ever was, except now he's just not running helter-skelter anywhere. He's running in a direction because now the rider is able, because he's bridled, to point him in a direction that will make progress in his life. Now he's good for something. Now he's used for something and he's useful for something. And so the word meekness is really uh, to come under control. Of course, the implication for us is that Christ is our rider and that once we allow Christ to bridle our life 
and our passions and our enthusiasm and our strength and our regard, our old wild, crazy, powerful, strong, a rebellious, out of control, self-serving self now has come under control of someone who has the bridle in his hands and can point us in a good direction. You know, I've heard folks say, and I've tried to win people to the Lord all my life. I tried to be a good witness, talk to them about, you know, do you know if you died, you'd go to heaven right now? Or do you have any faith in your life? Have you ever trusted Christ as your Savior? Whatever question it might be that pops out. And I've had some folks kind of indicate, really, well, I don't think I could really be a Christian because, you know, I'm just a little hot-headed, <laughs> really. I mean, I, I, I'm not very much under control, and, and I, I, I have a real strong attitude about things, and I have a real strong spirit as if somehow Christians uh, never experience uh, anger or, or, or have attitudes that are, that are powerful. I, I want to look at them and say, well, what do you think we are as Christians, Casper Milk Toast? Or, you know, I mean, you think we don't have a spirit? You don't think we have any passion? You don't think we have any anger that we have to control in life? I'm telling you, you know what we need as Christians? We need fire. We need passion in our life. We need, we, need to be, we need to be upset by some things in life. But what we need is we need our passion and our fire under control and pointed in the right direction. Pointed at the right enemy is what we need. Who is the enemy that we should be angry at? Well, we ought to be angry at the devil. We ought to be angry at evil in life. We ought to be angry at unrighteousness, at the drug traffickers, the human traffickers, the abortion mills, and all of that evil that has come against the kingdom of God on this earth. And so we, as Christians, we should be angry at some stuff. But the things that we're angry at should be controlled by the one who's holding the reins of our life so it can be pointed in the right direction. And Jesus is the perfect example of this. I mean, do you think that Jesus was weak? I mean, after all, before he was even born, when Mary and Joseph got the news that they had to go back to their hometown so they could be registered for some taxation, they had to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Do you know how many miles that is? 90 miles. Remember, Mary is very pregnant, very heavy. I mean, she's at the point where her child is about to be born, and now she's got to drag up on the back of a donkey. And I know many of you have never ridden a donkey before in your life. I've never actually ridden a donkey, but I've ridden a Shetland pony a lot. And I'm telling you, those little varmints are just mean as the dickens, boy. I mean, they are. They're honorary and contrary and everything else. And they, their little old backbone is really tough. And, and man, you just bounce up and down as you go along. And here you got a heavily pregnant woman, and she's bouncing for 90 miles. You know how long it took to go 90 miles in, in that day? Anywhere from four to seven days. Between four and seven days, that heavily pregnant woman had to get on that donkey and go every day bouncing over the Judean hillside from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And Jesus was jostled all of that time. Tell me he's not tough. And then when he got where he was going, he was born in a stable, right? He wasn't born in some uh, uh, clean medical facility where they, could, where they could take care of all of his needs and all of that. And it was wintertime, you know, and it was cold. It was, you know, and, and here he comes, birthed out in some stable where only the, the animals and the peasants and everybody, you know, were there around him. And then he walked through a countryside all of his life that was an arid desert countryside, and he walked almost everywhere he went. And he went from Judea to Samaria to Galilee, from Galilee to Judea to Samaria, back and forth about 150 miles one way or another all the time in his life. Was he not tough? He stilled the sea. He walked on water. He drove the demons out of the demoniac. Man, I'm telling you, Jesus was a strong man and a powerful man. But more than him having strength, he had his strength under control. So before Jesus tried to do anything to anybody else, or tried to do anything to something else, Jesus, first of all, had his own spirit under control. That's meekness. 
In John chapter two, I know some of you know about the temple, right? When Jesus went into the temple one day, when he went into the temple, it was Passover, a holy day for the Jews. And at Passover, the Jews did three things. Number one, they worshiped. Number two, they sacrificed uh, an innocent, an innocent uh, animal for the sins of the guilty. You know, they were sinful. And so every year at Passover, you had to take an innocent animal, a, a lamb or an oxen or a sheep or a goat or a dove or whatever it might be, whatever the, the, the custom was of the day, and you had to sacrifice, you had to spill the blood of the innocent so it could cover your sins, the sins of the guilty, which pointed to the fact that one day one was going to come and, and, and cover all of our sins forever. He was called the Lamb of God. But in the Old Testament, you had to do this every year. You just basically had to put off judgment until the next year. And the next year, you just put it off to another year and put it off to another year. It's not like us where Jesus washes us clean once and for all. You had to do this every year. Well, when these people came from all over the world, obviously they couldn't bring an animal with them. So what happened? That they had to purchase the animal after they got there. And they weren't all from the same country. They had to pay their temple taxes. That was the third thing they had to do. Everybody had to pay taxes to the temple because instead of having a federal government like the United States has, and we pay taxes to our government, they had a government. It was the temple, and they had to pay taxes to the temple. And so, of course, they weren't from the same country, so they had to have their money exchanged so that they would have the right money to pay to the temple and so what Jesus found in the temple that day was that there were uh, greedy uh, money changers that were taking advantage of the, of the inexperienced. If you've ever had to change money in your life, have any of you had to go somewhere and you had to exchange your money? Yeah, I have too. And I'm going to tell you something. I have no idea whether I got the right exchange or not. I mean, I don't, I, I really, I couldn't even tell you when they gave it to me if it was actually the right currency because I couldn't read that mumbo jumbo on that thing. Oh, and it was all sizes and different shapes and all that. And it was like, well, I just have to hope they gave me the right stuff here, you know? Well, these guys that, that were set up in the temple were crooked. They were, they were taking advantage of these poor people who didn't, who didn't know what they were supposed to be getting, and they were stealing and cheating and double dealing and, and all of that and robbing these poor people that had come to, to, to worship and, and sacrifice and pay their temple tax. And then the animal merchants were set over here with little sickly, weakly, little, little defective animals. And God said, I, I want the best. I want the top. I don't, I don't want those, you know, three-legged sheep and, and, you know, and, a, and, a, and a little lamb that had half a ear eat off of him or whatever it might be. No, I don't want the defective. I want the best you have. But they were selling these little defective animals so these people could sacrifice. And they had no choice but to try to buy it because they didn't have one and they had to sacrifice one. And Jesus walks into that situation right there. And when he walks into that situation right there, I'm going to tell you what. He could have annihilated that place with one word out of his mouth. But instead of annihilating that place, you know what he did? He stood there and he watched that for a few minutes. And as he watched it, he grabbed a few reeds over here, bamboo stalky kind of reeds, and he began to weave them together like that. And as he was watching and he... He would get more and more, you know, angry because he would see more and more evil and corruption and he's weaving these reeds together and he finally gets enough of them woven to be like a long whip and then he takes some leather and he wraps up and makes a make a handle, make do handle of that thing and he walks over there where they are and he begins to whip that thing and, and tell them, get out of here, you wicked evil man. And he drives them out of the temple with the passion and the zeal of the Lord, angry at the right thing, at the evil thing. So instead of annihilating the place, he was under control enough that he didn't call fire down from heaven, which he could have done, and annihilated everybody there in a moment like James and John wanted him to do one day out on, when they were out on the road, they came to this little Samaritan town and this little Samaritan town would not receive Jesus and let them stay there while they were on their way to Jerusalem. And James and John, two of the disciples that were called the sons of thunder, 
and they deserved their name. They looked at Jesus and they said, Jesus, do you, do you want us to do like Elijah did? Do you want us to call fire down from heaven and burn this wicked place up? And Jesus looked at them and said, no, man, what kind of spirit are you full of? We don't burn up villages just because they won't let us live there. See, Jesus was under control. He had all the strength to do anything he wanted to do, but he didn't let the wild horses run in his life. So Jesus is the perfect picture of, of zeal and passion and fire pointed at the right thing and keeping your strength, you could do whatever you wanted to, you're powerful enough, you're brave enough, you're strong enough, you could do anything you want, but for the sake of the mercy of God, you control that thing and temper that thing so that, that you can be pointed in a positive right direction and not just kill everybody. Moses is a great example. I told you in Numbers 12, you know, he was called a meek man, meeker than any man on the face of the earth. Well, what is that talking about? Well, you know, Moses was born as a Hebrew, and uh, back then the, the king had made out an order that all the Hebrew babies were to die. Mother, Moses' mother, Jehochbed, which I know you've never heard that name probably, but that was her name, and uh, she wrapped uh, little Moses up in a basket full of bull rush, uh, made of bulrushes and pitch, and she floated him down a little river there, and Pharaoh's daughter came out and caught all the little basket float and pulled it in and fell in love with the little fellow that was on the inside, and she took him up, and then uh, Moses' sister, Miriam, went to Pharaoh's daughter and said, hey, don't you need a nursemaid for that little thing? And she said, I sure do. And, 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 and Miriam said, well, let me go get you one. And she went and got her mama, which was his mama, and brought him back, and his mama took care of him while he was in, 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 as an Egyptian. How, how's that for a happy ending? Well, when Moses got old enough, Moses was out walking in the street one day and he saw a Hebrew, which is what he was. He saw a Hebrew being mistreated by an Egyptian. And out of his anger and hostility and wrath, he let the wild horses run loose in his life and he ran over there, and with his powerful hands, he killed the Egyptian. Well, a few days later, he was walking down the street, and some Hebrews were having a disagreement with each other. And Moses came over and said, hey, man, cut that mess out. And they looked at him and said, why? What are you going to do? Do what you did to that Egyptian and kill him? So the word was out, and Moses had to run for his life. There were wanted posters hanging up for Moses in, in, the, in Pharaoh's kingdom. He was wanted, dead or alive, murderer. Well, God said, you know, this is a good time for a vacation, right? And so I'm going to send you on a little uh, 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 all-expense-paid trip to meekness land. I'm going to teach you how to be meek, how to get under control. You're a powerful man, but you're going to have to be under control. So Moses was 40 years old now, and God said, uh, I, I like your enthusiasm, um, I, 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 like your, I like your passion about things like this. I love your strength, but uh, your, your style is going to have to change if you're going to be used by me in this kingdom of God stuff. And so he sent him to the backside of the desert, and when he got there, he found Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he had several daughters, and he said, okay, well, we'll just stay here on the backside, in the backside motel. And, and, and Moses stayed there, and, and Jethro said, well, take my oldest daughter, Zipporah, and she can be your wife, and that's what happened. And for 40 years, everybody say 40 years. 40 years. That's a long time, right? 40 years. Boy, Moses was hard-headed, wasn't he? I mean, it took him 40 years to learn how to be meek. Come on. And so God, you know, the first 40 years of Moses' life, he learned to be a somebody. They were training him to be an Egyptian. He probably would have been the Pharaoh if he had kept himself under control because Pharaoh really loved him as his own son, you know? And, 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 but he couldn't. He, he got out of control. He couldn't control himself. He had the wild horses running loose in his life. He was letting his passion run free and not have any control over his spirit and life. And so you can't go in the right direction. You can't do productive things you can't produce anywhere. You, you're not going anywhere if you're letting the wild horses run loose in your life. You're just helter-skelter, just led by your passions and your strength. And you're just going in all directions like a rat in a maze. 
Meekness means that somebody has the reins that can point you in the right direction and you can go somewhere and be productive. And so God takes him to the backside of the desert. He spent the first 40 years learning to be a somebody, the next 40 years learning to be a nobody on the backside of the desert. And then he spent the last 40 years of his life learning what God could do with somebody who had learned those first two things. And so Moses approached a bush that was on fire and God said, okay, uh, let's see if you learned anything. And the bush said, uh, take off your shoes, Moses. You stand on holy ground. Moses takes his shoes off. He said, all right, now I've heard your prayer and we're going to go do something about those, those slaves down in Egypt. And Moses says, hot dog, God, it's about time. And God looks at him and says, uh, yeah, I'm going to use somebody. I'm going to use you. And he said, duh, uh, duh, duh, uh, duh, uh, duh, duh, uh, duh. He said, you know, I don't speak, speak so good. And he started making all kinds of excuses. But God says, hey, man, you the man. And you get that rod, that shepherd's crook, and, um, and, and, uh, and we're going to use it. We're going we're gonna to get the evil out of it. Throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground. It became a serpent. A snake. How many of you would have hit the woods about that time? Yeah. And here's what God says. God says, pick it up by the tail. Now, I don't know if you know anything about snakes, but if you pick him up by the tail, that leaves the business end open, right? So you pick him by the tail, he's liable to turn and strike you. So you certainly wouldn't pick him up by the tail. Try to get him right behind the head or something. Moses reached down and picks him up by the tail and it turns into a rod again. Now that rod, it had the evil purged from it and, it, and it was no longer the rod of Moses, it was now the rod of God. And Moses says, take that rod and you, you, you can call fire down from heaven, you can part the Red Sea, you can call plagues down. And he did, man, gnats and flies and, and locusts and animal disease and, and uh, flies and uh, darkness and, uh, and, and anyway, uh, cattle disease. and all. I mean, he called down these plagues uh, to set the people free, but it was not Moses' power anymore. It was, he was under the, the control of the power of God. And only one more time, just to show you, only one more time did Moses ever let his flesh get in control of his life again. And when he did, it cost him dearly. Because the children of Israel got out into the desert with Moses leading them, and they got thirsty. And God came to Moses and said, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and speak to that rock. And when you speak to that rock, you tell the people that the reason you can speak to that rock is because my power is in you and I want you to honor me in the midst of the people and let them know that it's my power that's bringing them deliverance and water. And Moses said, yes, sir. And then when Moses got to the rock, instead of speaking to the rock, he took his rod and tapped that rock two times and then water came flowing out of the rock. God honored it anyway, but, but he looked at Moses and he said, all right, Moses, you hadn't, no, no, man, you hadn't learned, you hadn't learned a lesson. I told you to speak to that rock and let the people see that it was me who did this and not you, but you've let the wild horses run loose in your life again and, and you hit something instead of speaking like I told you to do. You're not under control. You're still uh, doing things for yourself. So you'll never see the promised land. That's what he told him, and he never did. Moses, bought, Moses' bones got to go into the promised land, but Moses never got to go in. So he got to look at it, but he wasn't allowed to go in it. So under his own strength, he lets his wild horses run loose into his life. But when God controls him, he went from a strong man to a meek man. And when Moses went from a strong man to a meek man, God used him to rout the enemies and to deliver the entire nation of Israel. Jesus hanging on the cross. He's hanging there on the cross. As Jesus hung on the cross, it looked to the entire world as if Jesus was weak hanging on that cross. He had been beaten beyond recognition. Isaiah said you couldn't even tell he was a man. So these sweet little images of Jesus on a cross that we wear around our neck aren't anything toward the truth. Jesus was beaten beyond recognition. You couldn't even tell he was a man hanging on the cross, Isaiah said. And he's hanging up there. And, and, he, and, by, and by all definition, he was weak. And they begin to mock him. And they begin to say, 
you saved others. Why can't you save yourself? And they mocked him and they said, if you're the son of God, come down off that cross. And they, and, and they scolded him because by all estimations, he was uh, uh, the picture of, of weakness hanging on that cross. But we all know that when he was hanging on that cross, he could have called 10,000 angels. What is the old song? Could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. Matter of fact, you wouldn't even need 10,000 angels. One would do the job. I can guarantee you that. One of them killed 19,000 Philistines in one swoop. So you don't need 10,000 of them. You could just take one. And you know, I can see, or I think I can see in heaven, here's Michael looking over the banisters of heaven with his sword drawn, saying, hey, just give me a flinch, babe. Give me a flinch. I'm ready. Gabriel's probably saying, Lord, if you need me, man, just, just, just flicker up that eyebrow. I'm watching. Come on. I'm ready to go. And the other angels uh, over the banisters of heaven with all of their swords drawn saying, saying uh, just just, just, just speak a word. Just speak a word. Come on, come on, Jesus. Just speak a word. That's all you got. And then Jesus spoke a word. Jesus said, forgive them. And the angel says, rats. That's not the word. <laughs> come on. Man. Don't you know they wanted to come down and vindicate Jesus? Don't you know they wanted to come down and just, and just put a whooping on the whole planet? And just show them how wicked and evil they were and punish them and destroy them. And they had every bit of the power to do that. And all Jesus would have had to do is just... <laughs> and man, they were on, on guard, boy. And if Jesus hadn't said, forgive them for they know not what they do, I'm not sure you could have held them back. But because he was under control, his strength was under control. That's what Jesus was like. That's what Jesus was. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to reproduce in us. Strength, power, passion, enthusiasm, anger against evil in the right places under control of the Spirit of God so that something productive can come out of it rather than something wild and destructive that happens when our passions get loose. I mean, think about it. When you get angry, I mean, I know most of you probably don't get angry, but if you do ever get angry, what comes out? Usually the most base thing in you, right? I mean, none of us are proud of that. No, we're, we're, when, when our burst of anger is over, we're going, oh my Lord, how could, I, how could I have said that or how could I have felt that? We're disappointed in ourselves because our, our, our anger doesn't work to our benefit. It works against us in our testimony. So God wants to control that. That's meekness. That's what meekness is all about. So what do I need to do? Well, serving the Lord really boils down, I think, to... to, to to something like this to understand it. Um, great sinners and great saints are made out of the same stuff. I mean, Stalin and Mussolini and Castro and Saddam and bin Laden and any other world crazy dictator you can talk about. They all, because of their ability to lead a bunch of people and persuade a bunch of people, would have made great evangelists just like Billy Graham. They had the ability, they had the personality, they had the charisma, they just didn't have it pointed in the right direction. And, and, and people like, uh, like Napoleon and, and Churchill and Patton and people like that would have made a great Apostle Paul because they had the determination and the administration and the skill and the wherewithal and the talents and the abilities to lead people and to marshal people made out of the same stuff. They just weren't pointed in the right direction. Hey, some of you could sell ice cubes to Eskimos. You have that talent and ability within you. You have that charisma and that personality and that wooing spirit about you. And people just love you and people are drawn to what you say. And you can sell Jesus just like you can sell ice cubes to an Eskimo. 
You just have to be pointed in the, in the right direction. And some of you can run businesses. You could certainly run a, a ministry in a church. You could administrate it. You could lead it. You could give it a direction in life. You see, you, you just have to be surrendered and pointed in the right direction. And God can take that drive that's in you and those abilities that's in, that are in you and your personality and your giftings. And if they're surrendered to him, you put a bridle on it, you've attached it to the kingdom of God, and you put the reins in Jesus' hand, it, 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 you can go just as far, you can go just as fast, you can be just as powerful, just as persuasive, only this time, you're headed in the right direction and you're doing something worthwhile with that human personality that God gave you. It's not the most gifted people that do the greatest things in the kingdom of God. It's the ones who are surrendered. There are many people way more gifted and talented than I am that could lead this church that could be passionate and speak and be powerful and persuasive and all of that. But they're not pointed in the right direction. God uses those who are pointed in the right direction, and that's what true meekness is. 